Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are back with a topic which is taking over the world of online trading. I did that without moving my lips. Anyway, yeah, so prop trading, a look ahead. Uh, we want to see where prop trading is heading and how to keep up with it. Please give a warm welcome to our moderator, Ms. Andrea Badiola Mateos, Chief Commercial Officer at Finance Magnets Group, who will introduce her panel. Andrea, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. I, am, I have to say I'm very, very excited about moderating this panel because I think it is the hottest topic of the second half of 2023 and I think it's only getting started for 2024. It's highly debated, it's the talk of all the corridors, there is a lot of strong opinions going on about it, so I'm very excited to have all of these very interesting guys sitting in the panel. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly so that we can get started with the conversation. Maybe you want to start, Otakar. Hello. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And also thank you all for coming. Um, Otakar, I'm founder and I'm currently also serving a role uh, of CEO in FTMO. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, yes, thank you to IFX for inviting us once again. It's nice to see that prop trading is starting to get attention at these events now. And it's starting to become a hot topic. Um, I'm Andreas. I'm the head of customer support for The Trading Pit, a multi-asset prop trading firm that's been around for just under two years now. And uh, I've been with the company for pretty much since day one. So I've seen a lot in terms of the risk of it, setting up the whole business, marketing, um, and the most important part, I think, the client feedback. So hopefully my insights can bring some value to the conversation today. Thank you, Andreas. Please. Hi, everybody. Gary, CEO and co-founder of FunderPro. Um, yep, so we're a B2B and a B2C provider in the space. Um, we've got a, a stand here today with our, our full service plot offering for prop firms. So very happy to be here today and to contribute. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Viktor Ivanov and I'm a Head of Business Development at Broker Solutions, responsible for EMEA region. At Broker Solutions we are a turnkey technology provider with more than a decade of experience in the retail brokerage market. Uh, so I will be happy to share our, uh, our experience and our expertise here today and thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you Viktor. Hello everyone, my name is Petros. I represent Tools for Brokers, so we are a pure B2B technology provider. I'm serving the company from the position of uh, Director and Head of Cyprus, which is responsible for CE and MENA regions. And uh, we are here on the side of the technology provider. And um, I'm also very happy to be on the panel with friends, partners and clients. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. We're, without further ado, because we have only 36 minutes and we want to keep five for questions if there is anything, so start thinking. Let's start by talking about the trends that are in prop trading lately and your predictions going forward. Who wants to take it first? Gary, I see you looking at me. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so I suppose a trend that we're seeing quite often from the B2B side, it's still getting a lot of interest across the board, but you know, even here this week, we're finding that now it's becoming uh, a wider and wider topic to even the industry that's here standing today. So for the past two years, I've been coming, speaking to regulated brokers and to other service providers, and it's been, you know, People haven't been aware. It's been, let's say, on the fringe of the industry. And now it's really just starting to get more and more uh, a part of the wider industry. So we've been having conversations this week with you know, quite well-established regulated brokers who are now really starting to consider it as an offering. Um, so I think trend-wise, we're seeing it will become more and more part of the industry. And I think um, there will be a, a wider offering from you know, your live account and your prop account. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to complete that? Yeah, I would like to add here that uh, from the technology point of view, from the technology side, we see that, first of all, it's a big trend. Uh, 
and uh, if like at the, I would say that like the beginning and the booming happened last year, and we saw a lot of new players, small companies, big companies, a lot of new players in this industry, and what we feel right now, talking with clients, with partners, that a lot of big names, uh, established retail brokerages are considering to go this way as well. So I would say that this will be the main trade for for this year, that we will see a lot of big names, well-established retail financial uh, institutions will start offering in some way, custom way probably, this prop trading service. Yes. Um, uh, I will 100% agree. Uh, the last trend that we saw in the second semester of uh, last year was that we have a tremendous interest from pure IT um, um, companies who would like to offer um, a similar white label solution to these uh, uh, prop, prop firms. So they are coming with a, a full front-end solution that can cover from uh, the website up to the, all the APIs or the connection that is needed uh, to provide to people who want to start up uh, from scratch a prop trading firm. So there is a small trend coming up uh, for a similar white label solution like the uh, good old days of Forex, in my opinion. Yeah, yes. I can add on that as well. I think the, the trend for 2023 was for prop trading was to actually start a prop trading firm. So there was so many starting due to um, companies that offer white label solutions and make it easy for people to start. So we have both smaller companies starting up and bigger companies that want to build their own tech and take it for the long term. Um, the only concern I have with that is if you don't do the research needed and you just try to white label something fast, when regulation comes across because it's coming, you might be caught by surprise. Um, so that's that part. And also I think within prop trading we've seen that um, community has become a trend. So we see on every, almost every prop trading site now, you see you can start the challenge at the top and next to it, join the Discord server. So Discord is becoming huge right now and prop trading firms are listening to their clients and having good conversations about what they should offer and how they should offer it. And sometimes going back to the client and telling them why you can't offer some certain stuff that they're asking for, they truly value. And that's, I think, where they start building a relationship with a prop trading firm. Very interesting. Otakar? Okay. Uh, I believe that Let's say for this I and mean, probably next year, the, our industry, which is nowadays booming a lot, but it needs to professionalize because, you know, as uh, say the IT providers, technology providers, they are allowing almost anyone to uh, to join, which might be good for uh, for many people. It is very attractive to them to start their own business. But on the other hand, it is also quite uh, dangerous to the industry because they, uh, let's say, they are too new, they might be too aggressive in marketing. So I believe that for the upcoming years, the industry needs to professionalize a lot. Uh, probably uh, what there might be uh, something similar to what we see in other industries that for pre for big companies will dominate the market, they will have the majority share and then lots of lots of small companies will fight for a minority 20-25% of the market. That's what I think will happen, but we will see. Yeah, time will tell, but definitely there is there has been a very strong trend. I think that everybody has witnessed it, but like I said, it's been very polemic as to the direction it should take, how it should go. We're, we mentioned regulation, we're mentioning consolidation, we're mentioning the speed of growth, the community. There is a lot of different elements that are starting to come together into the probe trading. But I, I want to I wanna do something polemic. I want to tell you that during our Finance Magnates London Summit last November, so about two months ago, there was a CEO of a top broker that said, you know, this trend. With me, traders can trade for free on a demo account. So what do you guys make of that kind of statement? Can I go first? All right, so I think... Um 
there's a high chance that the person that said that might not have actually understood the whole concept of it because you're not actually paying for the demo account, you're paying for the opportunity that comes with it. And a quick example for people in the audience that aren't familiar with prop trading is if you have $500 to invest and you go to a brokerage and you deposit and you're a good trader, you make 10% the first week, 10% the second week, and 10% the third week, you've accumulated 750, so 250 in profit. With that same statistic, if you go to a prop firm, week one, so with $500, you can get access to a $100,000 account. And if you make 10% the first week, 10% the second week, that's the challenge phase. So we're testing your ability to trade profitably and manage risk. Then the third week, when you do make that 10%, then it's 10% on a 100K account, right? Not on a $500 account. So you're actually talking about 10K in profit. And we split that according to the profit share. And that's the opportunity that comes with it. So I think with people that don't have enough funds to go big with their accounts, prop trading offers access to larger capital with less initial funds required. So yeah, I do think that demo accounts with prop trading firms are a little bit more, um, give more opportunity at the moment than demo accounts with brokers. I see that Gary wants to go next. <laughs> uh, it's funny that we had, so I suppose we're part of a larger group that does brokerage as a service solutions. And we had that exact same reaction around three years ago. We had a client come to us and say, hey, listen, we see this new trend coming on board and we really want to get in on it. And we were like, really? Demo accounts? Are people going to go and buy them? Uh, and obviously then, you know, three months down the road, they had implemented and we'd seen then done our research and found that, you know, it is actually an, an incredible solution for traders. Uh, and so obviously then at that point in time, we started, we said, okay, we missed the boat. We, need, we now need to, to join the industry. Um, but I think to double down on that, from our perspective, you know, the opportunity is one side of things, but I think also the ability to actually manage risk is another side. So for that same trader, if they're looking to actually earn a salary or earn, you know, the equivalent of a salary through their trading, they don't have to take such large risks. You know, if, if you started off with that $500, and you wanted to make $500 a month, you would have to double your account every time. You'd have to double your account. Whereas if you've got a 100K account, you need 0.5%. And now you've made the same amount of money. So I think it's the opportunity of being able to do it, but also then the reduction of the risk. Yes, if I can be even more polemic, <laughs> I would say that on the one hand, sure, but on the other hand, you're actually paying without getting a guarantee anything in return, which, you know, trading has its own risks, of course. But at the end of the day, you could always withdraw your deposits, you're supposed to, <laughs> if you wanted to. So um, it's paying the access to an account that doesn't have guaranteed access to the 100,000. So if I can ask, how do you ensure I mean, we all know that it's been successful as a, as a product for the traders, but how do you talk to the traders and tell them that, you know, that's a good product for them instead of investing at a CFD and having a CFD account? Yeah. I'll take her. Uh, I believe that, uh, I was speaking about it yesterday, but uh, there is a huge, uh, let's say, educational factor of let's say our clients when are joining FTMO. You just, it's not just about the... I think you can go on, just okay. keep, so, keep it close to your mouth. Uh, there is a huge educational factor when our traders are joining FTMO. It is not just about the uh, prop trading side, but, but when we were starting in 2014-15, we were quite afraid that uh, when people, they join FTMO challenge, they might get uh, they might get angry when they fail and ma majority of people they will fail so uh, it was very very important for us to make the journey let's say, beneficial to them so since the beginning we have applications statistics performance psychologists in the team which can be uh, who can be uh, asked and they can provide sessions to our traders and that's you know 
it that's the added value our traders are receiving. It's not just the prop trading side, but also they are paying for the service, which is uh, which is uh, which comes with the with the service. The education side, all the training, etc. Anyone wants to add something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think the the one thing to point out, I suppose, is for traders. A prop challenge is not for everybody. Uh, the same way as a live account isn't for everybody. You know, it, it really depends on your trading style and how you're using it and what you're trying to achieve, whether a, a live account or a prop trading account is for you. And so I think, you know, it can obviously be very attractive in terms of, you know, the opportunity that's there. But I think anybody who's thinking about which account to go for, they really need to assess their trading styles because we can see from the data, you know, traders are trading totally differently on a live account versus a prop trading account. And so it really then depends whether that trading style suits their abilities and, and their, you know, their patterns, if that's going to work for them or not. Some people are incredibly profitable. Some people are really, you know, really calm and collected when they get funded. Other people panic, realize that they've gone through a couple of challenges and they've been very steady and then they panic when they go live. So, you know, it, it really depends on the trader which type of account is for them. So I, that's what I'd say, you know, both have a valid place in the industry. It just then depends on the trader and their choice which one they go for. Yeah. Basically, nothing to add, big professionals of the of the process of selling this this business and this service for me yeah it's just a just a part of education it's a smooth entrance into the trading with low risk the risk is limited by the amount you pay from the very beginning that's basically it. Um, even to your comment why should I pay for something that doesn't guarantee uh, so you're not actually paying only for the demo account. Uh, so some of the very reputable companies um, combine this payment with even one-on-one one, one -on -one coaching on trading. They have uh, training programs. Uh, they, they provide you access to huge community channels. Like there, there are social media channels with more than 100,000 members in some of the companies in the sector. So yes, there, there is um, a small fee, but technically somebody is, is buying a service, uh, and this is how it should be uh, seen, in my opinion. And can some of you expand a little bit more on the profit sharing model of the prop trading as a firm? How to keep traders incentivized while it's sustainable for their business? So I think the question is how to stay sustainable because people think that when you have a trader that comes through, so I was having a discussion with this trader in Discord the other day um, where he said that all you want is to make money from challenges and that whenever you pay someone out, that's a loss for the business and how are you going to sustain it and so on and so forth. That might be the case for many new smaller companies, but companies that are taking it seriously and want to build for the long term they want to monetize the second phase as well. So when you pass, and this is like, this is no secret, you can't copy the signals of every single trader that passes the challenge because many of them just gamble, they pass, and then when you copy them in the earning phase, the company's gonna lose, right? So if you have the right minds in the company to do it, what we're doing now is we're trying to, um, and this is where AI is gonna come around as well, we're trying to find patterns and understand the behavior of the trader through the challenge and as many challenges or accounts as he's had to be able to see whether or not we want to partner with this guy and copy his trades also into our account. Otherwise, we just leave it there. And of course, anyone that makes a profit is going to get paid out. But for the long term, I think the companies are going to stick around. You either have to find a way to monetize the second phase because just paying them out from the profits that you make from the challenges is not going to work. It's not sustainable. So yeah, the focus should be on monetizing the second part and finding ways to identify patterns and understand trader behavior, I think. Okay. Maybe Autocar, since FTMO has been around for a while, you can uh, enlighten us. Uh, I more or less uh, agree with what Andreas has said. Uh, 
believe that many newcomers are just a pure B book, which is not uh, sustainable for the for the long term. And honestly, if you want to stay in the business for uh, long long term and share the sustainability, you need to also m monitor your risk, uh, work with your data, looking for, look for uh, new streams of income. For example, just. The last year we have acquired a real proprietary trading firm, which means a firm which is trading just their PL. It is not uh, about any additional streams of uh, from FTMO challenges. So and this firm is full of let's say super smart people. They have more than 1,000 applicants for one uh, one position. And this is what we are doing, let's say, to enhance our risk models to find new streams of income from analyzing our own data. So I believe what Andra said is that's what we are doing as well. Uh, one thing I'd add to that, I suppose, from our perspective, you know, in terms of the funding element, so I suppose we take it quite differently where we actually fund every trader, um, which would be quite different from the industry. and. You know, from our side, it's getting the criteria right through the challenge, which you know may not be as competitive as the rest of the industry, to then have the ability to fund everybody. Because as as we were saying here, you know, some people get through the challenge and then their mentality switches, and all of a sudden they become unprofitable, which is obviously a risk. But also, then there are some people who sustain over time. So I think having the criteria set in the beginning sends a signal of the type of business that we are and that it's okay that we're not the easiest but you know the conditions that you're then coming into which then means we have the ability to fund so i think it all comes down to making the business sustainable and i think there's two elements of it there is the criteria that you're applying to the traders in the challenge phase and then the model that's being run uh, at the other side now I would think in time, yes, the best model would be a hybrid approach of understanding the trader and really doing the analysis and understanding at what, point, what points they should be internalized and what points they should be hedged. Um, but I think right now it's just an area of the industry that is so, uh, even from a data perspective, we're still learning so much that I don't think it's there yet to really make those decisions. And now with the rise of the AI, also, 2023 has been a trend for it. Andreas, you were touching upon a point where you were saying, you know, we're trying to learn from it and then pick the signals and you cannot copy every tool, etc. Is AI now part of the inherent technology that is being used to identify this? And maybe uh, Pedros and Victor, they can also throw some light into, into this. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so what is AI and machine learning? It is a huge amount of data which now we can successfully analyze and do some, make some decision automatically based on the whole amount of data. So what data here with trading, prop trading, we can analyze. It's the trading information. So uh, guys, uh, we're talking a lot about education part of this business, of this trend. And I would say the main focus in terms of AI and big data here would be to analyze the trading process, trading information, and then probably to suggest some changes to make it as a part of the challenge, not just the restrictions, but also suggestions on how to enhance the trading. And I already spoke with several startups who are already working on, on, on this analysis. Yeah. So this kind of, and, and for on another side, of course, if we see a big trade trend, a lot of people uh, are coming into it and it can be people with different purposes. So I would say that AI and big data is a good tool to fight with frauds to, because like people are constantly searching for a way how to uh, break the system and that will be a very nice solution for that. How do you think, Petrus? Well, probably we need another panel just for this topic, but yeah. um, see it also from our clients. Uh, AI is actually a must, but Victor uh, said one word that is very important, suggest. So the technology is there to serve the clients. It will be faster, smarter, 
and all these great things. But at the end of the day, it comes back to the risk management and a human being has to take a decision. So should we send the flow? Should we keep it in house? Should we use this uh, bot for, uh, I don't know, engagement with support in the clients and etc. cetera? Um, from our side, uh, is a huge part of our development circle. It's a must. Uh, we're already using AI in most of our uh, products. Uh, but unfortunately, we had cases that the client didn't really understand the power of the automation, and that can cause some quite big issues. So it has to be there, but it has to be there as a tool to help you get better decisions. And um, Gary, Andreas, and Otakar, how are you, are you making use of AI? Is it something that you have managed to embed into your operations? I will be very brief. We are using AI, let's say our developers are using to create code, also to comment code. We have our own internal FTMO bot. Uh, you can ask it for any news, anything about FTMO. So our employees are using that to, let's say, keep up with updates and questions about FTMO. Yeah, I don't want to take much time up on this because we have the professionals talking about it. But yeah, definitely what they mentioned before as well, operations, so chatbots for support, obviously, and getting the KYC done, getting stuff done faster overall. And then the second part, what we said about analyzing traders' trades, especially when they move into the earning phase, um, to be able to make informed decisions. So yeah, we, we're still exploring. We're still exploring. Yeah, likewise. The, the easy way to get AI in is through support, uh, which is, uh, I think, where we've all focused because it improves the customer experience. It gives them the right answers and much quicker. Um, obviously, the, the harder one, which is going to require all of the data, is having it to analyze the risk element. So, you know, from a wider organization, we have models from a brokerage perspective, which are quite accurate and working, uh, but modeling that in through to prop just again that mentality difference and you know the the i suppose not having skin in the game um does just change the mentality quite a bit and, and it brings it from a hard data calculation perspective to also really bringing in you know the emotions of the trader into those models which obviously then makes it just far more difficult to model out Thank you. And uh, maybe we have 12 minutes left, so maybe last question before we open the floor for, for questions. Um, let's talk about regulation. So prop trading at the moment is a gray zone in regulation. How, I mean, you all come from different companies, from the financial industry, part of groups. We were talking about the trend in 2024 as well. It can be existing brokers, existing companies adding prop trading to their current offering, etc. How do you see the regulatory landscape in 2024? Do you, are you adjusting to it? Is it posing any challenges? Otakor? I believe that, as you said it, uh, the challenge is our business model. I believe it's uh, too new, it's too innovative, it's very difficult to explain it to the regulators which are not used to it. And um, also, uh, honestly, we are spending millions of dollars on regulation in multiple jur jurisdictions to keep up with the regulation in, in countries where we are, let's say, operating. And I don't like to speak about regulation because it is very, very sensitive topic. Uh, we don't know, uh, I believe it's like impossible to say what is going to happen when the regulation or the guidelines for our industry will be. Just imagine you have regulation in Europe, in Australia, in the US, and it's going to take a lot of years because there for the guidelines to be more or less the same as they are for the uh, brokerage companies. So I believe it's better to leave the regulation for experts, which, because it is a very sensitive topic. Andreas? Yeah, so I'm no regulatory expert as well, but I think it has to come to level out the playing field, because as we said before, there's companies just showing up every day and they don't even take it seriously. So this is, I think, where we also have an advantage having um, uh, 
management team coming from the brokerage business, we understand how the brokerage business works in terms of regulation, and we're trying to be proactive as well, spending a lot of money in regulation now to find out what's coming. The bad thing is that we're spending a lot of money to find out, and nobody knows what's coming. So things that I would personally like to see and things that clients are always asking for are, for example, maybe we can publish the pass rates on the websites, maybe how much we're paying out, something like that, like the brokerages are doing with their success and failure percentages. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't think we know what's coming. I just hope that they, they do analyze the model and they take good decisions when it does come around because otherwise, as Otakar said, it's just going to cramp the innovation and the growth of the whole sector. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd back that last point of saying yes. It, unfortunately, regulation could obviously stifle the industry in terms of the innovation and even the benefits to the end trader, which is obviously the, what regulation should promote. Um, you know, from our perspective, we're looking forward to the day that it does come in because uh, at the end of the day, you know, there are not everybody in the industry are, are good actors. And, you know, from our perspective, in all of the companies that we're working in, we're all trying to promote the right way of doing it with, because we believe in what the model is. Um, as a technology provider, our goal is always to try and identify people who aren't going to do it the right way because we don't have any interest in working with somebody who's just in here to make a, a quick book and leave. So from our perspective, when regulation comes in, you know, we'll be as prepared as we can for it uh, and, you know, maybe even be near the front of it. As Adhikar said, you know, it will become a time when it comes in, there will be the few left standing and then, you know, the, the rest of the industry and, and hopefully it will wipe out, you know, the people in the industry who are, who are shining a bad light on it. At Broker Solutions, we just released a new software for prop trading called Prop Pulse. And uh, it's, it's mainly built for retail brokerages, so we talk a lot with them um, about how they are going to structure this uh, offer. And what I can say like right now is that all of them are trying to build the structure according to the current way of how they work with retail brokerage. So they, they, are, they are expecting to get the regulations sometimes in the future and like the business model is already fitted fitting the the possible possible uh, restrictions or something like that so i would say that in terms of regulations yeah so far we don't know but people who are now like starting to establish the this business like from scratch they already preparing I think that um, uh, whoever is actually ethical in terms of the company logic has nothing to be afraid of the regulation. Um, on a personal opinion, I mean, like companies like ours will be the least uh, impacted, uh, regardless of how strict the regulation will be. But um, as Victor said, we speak with the brokers, and they are all have the same logic that yes, we know that it might come. So we are trying our best to be prepared for what is coming. Unfortunately, nobody can know what uh, is coming. Even the regulators are learning the model in, in many countries. They don't understand the model yet. And uh, since the operational flow is fundamentally different from a Forex broker, I mean, there are no clients' funds, which is the base in most cases for the regulation, right? So the business model is different. Um, I think there should be a regulation just to eliminate the open doors for scammers and unfortunate events. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, is, the, the, the model itself is slightly different, so by no means we should compare it with, or we should expect um, um, a heavy and strict regulation just like in forex sector. Thank you all for your insights. We have five and a half minutes left, so I'm going to open the floor for questions. We have two over there, uh, Hormus, he was the first one. Hi, my name is Hormos from ATFX. I have a question regarding if a broker like us would want to do prop trading, would you recommend setting up a brand new brand 
or keeping the existing brand for prop trading? I guess it's a question for maybe Gary and Victor on technology side, maybe more. But for all of Very you. interesting question. Yeah. Uh, I suppose there's always benefits and, and trade-offs with that. Um, from, I suppose, a promotional perspective, it's actually quite interesting to have the broker and the prop firm under the same branding. Um, having that allows your trader to actually make a decision and allows the business to have multiple revenue streams and multiple ways, you know, multiple flows for a trader to engage with their services. So uh, I suppose, you know, understanding with your regulators and your licenses how that will impact and, and how, they'll, how the regulator will see that, of course, is, is something that, you know, your team would uh, definitely have to review. But from a perspective of having both of them tied, um, you know, at, at certain points in time where you have acquired your traders, um, you know, through your marketing or, or through other channels, you would have a, always an enormous amount of your audience that have never engaged. And so what we've seen is people who are in that pool who have signed up for your services, they have maybe even KYC'd and they've still not gone on to use uh, your live accounts. Having that prop solution as well as the brokerage gives them an alternate solution to actually engage with your brand. It shows that you're, I suppose, you know, the reason everyone's in the room today is because it's something still quite new in the industry. So it shows that the broker is leading and, and adapting to new technologies. Um, so uh, I suppose it, it now shows your traders that you, they've got a new solution and yeah, and then as they're in taking your services, then there's the potential of them maybe going onto a live account in time. Yeah, I can barely add something extra to Gary's answer, uh, very like complete. Uh, what I can say from my experience talking to other companies who are looking to start, most of them considering to open a new brand. It can be somehow, in some cases, it can be completely new brand. In some cases, it's like it's un it's clear that it's the same one, but they still try to 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 have it separate. Thank you. There was another question there. Hello. Yeah. Hi. My name is Hani Hamdan. Uh, if you are using the same exact strategy. Okay, in algo trading or in manual trading, why a trader may success in FTMO using FTMO challenge, but may exactly uh, fail using your challenge or your challenge, using the same exact strategy in manual trading or uh, algo trading? So I guess it has to do with what comes from the prop trading side, right? So when you have when we as a company set some certain rules, it has to do with some experiences that we, we might have had with certain traders in certain markets. Um, are you referring to like um, certain... Um, uh, so what I want to ask is, do you mean that it would breach the rules from the drawdown side? For example, we might have 3% drawdown and FTM might have 4%. So we have different rules with different companies. So depending on what rules we have on the percentage, you might, if you go down 3% and we have a 3% stop out, you might be out. Whereas if FT1 has 4%, you might have an extra 1% to come back up. Um, now then again, there's different um, prohibited strategies that we have as well. So for example, one of them is you can't make all the profit in one trade. Other companies might allow that. From the experience that we've had in the market, we don't want to see traders gambling and going all in, hoping to make all the profit in one trade. So that might also be if you're using an EA, and you open one big trade because of a signal that you got, we might not like that, we might not want to work with you in the long term. But everything that we do, do when it comes to not passing client, it's always clear, transparent on the website, and we never try to hide any rules to cut you from our um, prop firm and pass on another one. So. Okay, one last question over there, and we will finish with that. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Anas Al Manakli. I am a professional trader and portfolio manager. I'm also a prop trader. Uh, I have three questions, if you would like to excuse me. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, for Mr. Otakar, uh, why is the FTA1 company is the least company in the whole industry to promote promotions and discounts and bonuses? If you know all the prop firms in the industry, all of them do a lot of ads and promotions, discounts. Why is FTMO is the least uh, company in the whole industry about this topic? And there is no ads at all, I think, and no promotions. I think the last promotions you provided in the December, in the event of New Year, is 10%. That's all. So why is that? This is the first question. The second question... Let's try to keep it to two because we're going over time, so oh. choose one. <laughs> oh, choose one. Okay, I would like uh, to talk about uh, the why you are banning the U.S. citizens because I'm Syrian. Why you are banning the U.S. citizens to enter your company? I know there is some sanctions from the U.S. regulators about the U.S. country, but it is uh, only about the country, not about the citizens living outside of the banned countries. Because right now I am a Syrian and living outside of uh, Syria. I live here in Dubai, and also I can't purchase any account from your company. All of the other platforms I can purchase any account with any other company only FTMO is banning the people of the banned countries not the country itself so why is that and I hope I th uh, this topic is, will be changed in the future can Thank I add you. three question or no three let's keep it at that because we're one minute over time and we need them to answer so <laughs> thank you very much after oh. the panel you can approach them okay Okay, so thank you for the uh, question. I was asked many times about it uh, when I was working in the expo. Honestly, if you know FTMO, we are, you know, we are in it for the long term. US market is quite uncertain nowadays. I can say there is no in investigation about FTMO. Uh, so it was just about uncertainty to, uh, to, let's say, protect the most of our businesses which is elsewhere than in the United States. So uh, I believe we just uh, playing it safe and that's basically the reason it was our business decision. And regarding the Syria, I'm quite sorry about it, but Syria is banned from, let's say, in our country and probably in the most countries to work with Syrian uh, citizens. So. I'm um, you know, sorry about it, but we cannot send money to any Syrian uh, citizens. Again, we are playing it safe. We might send you crypto or I don't know, but it is, it is just not how it should be done. So, sorry for that. I think it's about the banking system in general. There is uh, very tough regulations and restrictions imposed when it comes to transactions. Um, the US, it's the highest regulated markets when it comes to finance. So I think it's a preemptive measure and I, I would understand where would that, that would come from. Yeah. Okay, so with that, thank you so much everybody. This has been extremely insightful and um, enjoy the rest of the expo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.